We just came back from a short break and uh, Attorney Plantinga, you can go ahead and continue with uh, the questioning of Dr. McMurray. Okay, Judge, Dr. McMurray. Before we begin questioning, uh, ask for you to make a direction for all witnesses that they have nothing in front of them in terms of aids or prepare testimony of that sort. You can make the same instruction to my witnesses as well. But, sure. And I, I haven't seen a, a, ter, a Dr. McMurray looking at anything. Do you have anything in front of you, any kind of writings or notes or anything? I have my phone here. Just your phone? Yes. Okay. Yeah, just, I I will say that Nobody to everybody, but yeah, we shouldn't, yeah, we yeah. shouldn't have any notes or anything. I, from what I could tell, your testimony looked like it was coming from your own recollection it didn't appear that you were reading anything so but i will make that uh, to all the witnesses going forward thank you judge okay um dr mcmurray uh, earlier you talked about um getting an incomplete patient history um and you just touched on also uh the problematic interactions with either a patient or a patient's family. Um, what effect, uh, if any, uh, can that have on uh, patient um, uh, safety? Um, uh, um, well, from a, from a strict accuracy and uh, uh, correct diagnosis perspective, if you do not have the patient's full cooperation, for instance, they you and you don't get reliable data. If you are if you if you take that for what the person's actual capabilities are, you could potentially misdiagnose someone as having dementia when they do not. Uh, potentially, for instance, if they are being uncooperative for whatever reason. Um, you can uh, essentially, the uh, defensiveness can lead to like uncooperativeness and they just, they'll just not try as hard as they can. And if that's the case, then those, if the data is not reliable, it can lead to someone making an inaccurate diagnosis. So we frequently will be asked to characterize the severity of uh, someone's dementia or whether or not someone has dementia. Um, and if, in fact, you overstated or you understated, then it can be problematic in terms of things like making recommendations about their ability to drive, their ability to make decisions, their capabilities to live independently, et cetera. And, and that might, um, have, having a, the wrong diagnosis, uh, communicating that to the original treating care provider who asked for a consult, uh, what effect might that have? Well, inaccurate treatment or inaccurate uh, di appropriate testing uh, that needs to be done, um, or failure to you know provide whatever indication for medication uh, versus not uh, someone is um, uncooperative, for instance, um, with you know uh, depression screening, and they just say no to everything when in fact they are quite depressed. Um, if there's not a recommendation that it appears this person is depressed and they, so there's no prescription required or recommended, uh, they could potentially become more profoundly depressed. Um, if the, you know, as a, as the consulting provider, it's not unusual for me to make recommendations, for instance, about whether or not someone requires intervention in the form of medication uh, for uh, mood disorder or behavior disorder. You indicated that uh, you had learned about um, some um, patient uh, and uh, patient family interactions with Dr. Schwartz. Um, had had you learned also about um, doctors, referring doctors uh, who um, had concerns? 
Well, yes. Uh, I, I mean, on a, on a personal level, I had, there were there was a psychiatrist who had talked with me about a patient that he had had uh, Dr. Schwartz evaluate, and he kind of uh, questioned the diagnosis and reviewed the case with me. And I, you know, I I talked with him. About, I consulted with him about the case about the with the psychiatrist. Um, but there was, uh, there, there were also, there was also an instance where, uh, hospitalist, uh, I was on call. Actually, I wasn't on call. Um, and he asked, he called my office and asked if I would see a patient who was on the inpatient unit. And I reviewed the chart and briefly, and when you go into Epic to medical record, there is a way to search for terms. And I searched to see if the patient, cause he had a history of stroke. So. I searched to see if he'd ever been seen by neuropsychology. Um, and I saw that he had been seen like six months before. And so I called the hospitalist and I explained to him, I said, I got this consult. Um, however, you know, he was just seen less than six months ago uh, in the neuropsychology clinic. And, and, and he said, uh, Dr. McMurray, I, I saw the note and I would like you to see the patient. And so I, and so I did. And when this patient had been seen in um, neuro uh, psychology before, who had seen the patient? Dr. Schwartz had seen the patient and performed the evaluation. And so you were asked to do another workup, even though one had been done uh, six months before? Yeah, uh, which is not all that unusual, um, except that uh, it, I would say at least 80% of the time, the question uh, that is posed to us for inpatient consultation is whether or not someone has capacity for uh, making medical decisions um, or if they have the capability to, you know, go to rehab or whatever the case may be. Um, so in this instance, I, I would not even have read the note except that I read it to get information about what had been done and what the you know what the diagnosis had been and how that had been you know what had been addressed in the in the consult and so in reading the consult it became clear to me why he, he had requested the evaluation because there was no there was no there wasn't a diagnosis made in the report it was uh, quite disjointed in the nature of this gentleman's stroke um it was a right hemisphere stroke which can affect things other than uh Cognition, in other words, individuals can have good memory, they can have good language skills, but they are impaired in other ways, including behaviorally. And uh, there was no, it also can cause a loss of insight, awareness of one's self, one's self perception of deficits or of their capabilities, uh, etc. And so when I read the note, I was concerned for a number of things. Uh, the, the conclusions were uh, disjointed and like I said, there was no diagnosis made. And the nature of the testing was uh, un unusual and ex somewhat extraordinary in my experience. Um, and there had been no assessment of right hemisphere function per se and that did not include anything about his capacity or how he was potentially incapable of making decisions that were in his best interest or his awareness. The word insight did not appear in the results and a right hemisphere stroke, that type of neurocognitive syndrome is very well described. Um, and there were inaccurate conclusions made based on personality assessment testing that was done that was ex that was not a test that should be given to someone who had a right hemisphere stroke. Um, and so I, under I understood the concern. I saw the patient. I diagnosed the patient with vascular dementia, um, signed a statement of incapacity for the patient. <clears throat> and I went to my colleague, Dr. Ray Kemper, and I showed her the note. Um, and I said, you know, this is problematic. This happened in I want to say July of 2015. And she agreed that it that there were issues with the report. And I said, would you go to me? Would you go with me uh, to address this with Julie Jackson? Uh, because I did I was not confident in how she would take it. And I I didn't want to be viewed 
it as being biased. I wanted someone else, uh, another neuropsychologist to sort of back me up. Um, and she declined to do so, saying that she feared for her livelihood and that she that he is the boss um, and she didn't want to get fired. And so I didn't go to Julie with the report. Um, but a couple of months later, during my evaluation, my annual evaluation, um, I explained to Julie that I remained con one of my, I, in our discussion, I explained to her that I remained um, very tense and uneasy about the situation, that I felt that anything I would do would, you know, cause my termination. And she assured me things are getting better. I've heard that, you know, I, it's, you seem, things seem to be going fine, et cetera. And I said, so I, I don't want to be terminated. And she said, I have no, she indicated that she had no plans to terminate me and that I should continue to feel free to bring things to her regarding um, Evan's clinical issues. And I said, in that case, and I presented her with the report and I, I said, this is, uh, I have concerns about this report on an, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, you know, the documentation was was uh, insufficient. The nature of the evaluation was incomplete, and most concerning was that it demonstrated a lack of knowledge of that neurobehavioral syndrome. Um, and so I, I explained all of this to her, and she suggested that I could potentially mentor him and work with him about these types. And I. I explained to her that I did not think that that would be the way to address this, that I had had interactions with him where I had made recommendations and he had not had not taken, um, you know, the advice. And so and I didn't feel like the interactions between us were positive. I think he viewed them as adversarial. And so I told her that I think what should happen is uh, that I would like to request that a peer review be done. And uh, let me back up. Let me back up here. When when you were saying, and this is in your annual review in 2015 with Julie Jackson, when you are saying that uh, you brought up the report, is that the same report you had been talking about earlier that you had shared with uh, uh, Gina Ray Camper? Yes, in July. Okay. Um, all right. So then your um, part of your uh, yearly evaluation, and Julie Jackson is the person who is doing it, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, Julie Jackson, um, she's not a she's neuropsychologist a herself, correct? No, she's no, a nurse she's by training. Okay. Um, but then she works in management at uh, Pro Healthcare. Yes. All right. Um, and the um, what what is the uh, peer review uh, process? So. Uh, when uh, someone expresses concern about a about a colleague's uh, whatever issue, um, the typical the by based on our um, you know our ethical standards, the uh, the optimal approach is to uh, discuss the the issue with the individual directly, uh, bring it to their attention, and discuss what you feel like could potentially you know be problematic about it, etc. Um, that is the that is the preferred method of addressing this in a collegial and professional manner. Um, but as I explained to Julie, I didn't feel like I could do that. And so, it, it, within the hospital system, if you have concerns about a specific instance of patient care uh, or the uh, patient interaction or uh, behavior of an individual or the professionalism of an individual then you re submit a request with specific with specific reasons for doing so, document them, and you submit them to the med staff office. And the med staff then um, makes an evaluation based upon the committee, executive committee, whether or not there is foundation for, um, you know, and they can address it in a number of ways. They can address it by, counseling uh, with the individual. They can address it by having another uh, professional in that field address it with them, um, or they can, you know, uh, uh, refer, they can have another professional who is 
um, outside of the institution or is otherwise considered an unbiased and independent evaluator review the work and make uh, an assessment of whether or not they feel like it meets a standard of care or if there's problems with it. And who um, who was heading up the uh, med staff? It's called med staff? The medical staff office. Okay. Who was heading up that uh, medical staff office on that uh, time frame of to September 2015? Uh, Karen Colchin, Dr. Karen Colchin uh, was the head of the med staff at the time. And Karen is K-A-R-I-N? Yes. Um, and Colchin. K U L. T G E N. Okay. When you um, brought that up, the issue of peer review to Julie Jackson, um, what did she suggest uh, that you do? Um, well, as I said, first she suggested that I mentor him, and I explained to her that I felt that we were past that point. There, where that would be an effective means of remediating this type of what I consider to be kind of a hole in his knowledge base. And so she, she suggested that I perform the peer review. And I explained to her that that's not what happens. That's not how it works. I can't be the peer reviewer because first of all, I'm, a, you know, in practice, it's a conflict of interest, but also there's Clearly, there's a history, um, and including with her, of perceiving me as being on as as being biased against this provider. So I said the peer review needs to be completed by someone who is clearly has no stake, who is outside of the institution. I said, for instance, Dr. Ray Kemper would not be an appropriate person to do this because she is in the same practice. It would put her in a position uh, where there is a conflict of interest. Um, and so it needs to be someone from outside the institution. And I said, there, you know, there are people that uh, there are individuals who are very qualified to do this kind of a review um, at Freighter, uh, the medical college at, at Aurora, at, you know, a number of different places. And, and, with respect to both yourself and Gina Raycamper, this would also, if, if you were to do it, would involve um, the evaluation of their supervisor, correct? Well, yes. Okay. And and that would be problematic uh, for yet another reason. Yes. My my hesitancy is there that there's the, the supervisory aspect of that director role is not a supervision of one's clinical work. Um, if I could pull up um, C5. Okay. Can you see this? Yes. And can you tell me what uh, C5 is? Um, this is the, uh, le the, when Julie told me to go ahead and uh, write up this request for a peer review um, and to submit it to Dr. Colchin and uh, ask that, you know, when I do so to also provide her with a copy. And so this is the review. It took me a couple of weeks to write this and get it done. Um, I hand delivered the signed copy of it to Dr. Colchin at the meds, well, not into her hands, but into her assistant's hands. Um, and then I um, emailed a copy of it to Julie Jackson, uh, but it probably, so the September 18, it probably didn't get there till early October. And do any of your concerns uh, in uh, this uh, C5, do any of these touch on um, any potential risk to patient uh, health or safety? Yes. In, the, in, what, in what way? 
Well, in in particular, <laughs> there there were uh, a number of conclusions uh, drawn uh, by Dr. Schwartz regarding this individual's um, uh, personality uh, characteristics as uh, somewhat being character disordered. Um, however, ba based on I think I'm uh, extrapolating here, but there was a patient one of the, one of the family members reported that the patient didn't seem to care about anybody but himself and didn't uh, demonstrate any thought for anyone else and didn't, you know, display, display empathy for other people. And so um, he, uh, based on the findings of the, uh, the personality assessment inventory, which is a widely used clinical tool to assess for psychopathology and characterological disorders, um, he uh, indicated that the the, that the individual had, had psychological issues that I believe to be directly related to the stroke. Um, but he doesn't, doesn't even, it didn't raise the possibility that this was a stroke related change in this gentleman's psychological functioning and his capabilities. Um, and the ability to be able to get accurate data from a personality assessment inventory requires one to have intact insight and self-awareness, which this gentleman did not have. Um, and so it, drawing conclusions based upon the, those results is inaccurate. And the personality assessment inventory isn't normed on individuals with neurologic disease like this. Um, and it is not indicated to be it. So there's no, there's no statistical or normative basis for drawing conclusions uh, based on the uh, based on his responses to the 344 item test. Um, and how might the other that, issue, Oh, uh, sorry. How how might that affect uh, uh, health or safety of the patient? Well, so it, the the issue is that <laughs> if there's not an awareness on the part of the family or caregivers that this alteration in one's capacity for empathy, for instance, or the ability to be able to, you know, think about something other than themselves or to act appropriately, if there's an awareness that it is a, that it's neurologically based, that it is a result of the stroke, there can be interventions, you know, prescribed or recommended that could circumvent those deficits. Um, and so there can, those kinds of behavioral problems and problematic family interactions often lead to caregiver burden and placement of patients in, in, in care facilities. It also makes them very difficult to place in things like daycare uh, settings where there are other individuals that they have to get along with, for instance. And so there is a there is concern from a safety perspective that the individual isn't capable of being sort of proactive in terms of their awareness of their deficiencies. And so he's not safe to be left alone. He's not safe to be, you know, to uh, make decisions on his own. But none of those things are addressed. And so if the individual is asked by a physician, do you want to take this medication? It's in your best interest to take this. And they say no, then they're not getting the treatment that they need uh, potentially. And so it, it was problematic from in this instance specifically from a number of perspectives, uh, the family's ability to care for him, but also the inaccuracy of the conclusion and the failure to cite what are widely known stroke related behavioral changes um, was it, it, it just it was it, it was uh, quite out of the ordinary. Before I forget, I uh, moved into evidence exhibit C5. Any objections, Attorney Mitchell? No objection. All right, uh, exhibit C5 is received. <clears throat> no. Uh, you you talked about uh, health and safety. Um, are there any professionally recognized accrediting or standard setting bodies that um, discuss this or uh, uh, have regulations uh, relating to this? Well, the the 
APA ethics uh, and code of conduct uh, does describe ethical standards for uh, test selection, the appropriateness of tests, uh, the, the you know the about making decisions to um, uh, uh, making decisions to administer a test, should, and the tests that are used should have uh, sub, should be normatively appropriate to the person who's being tested. Um, and that there are sometimes instances in which you cannot use a well uh, developed measure, but you have to describe, you know, what the what what's lacking about the normative development of such a measure. But it is also prescribes that if you use something that is not normed on that patient population, that there that it's it's not an appropriate use of tests. Um, which doesn't mean that it doesn't get done, but an explanation and a clinical rationale for including something like that um, d does should be made. And so there are there are instance there are indications in the ethical guidelines that talk about test selection. They talk about the need to you know make sure that there is a diagnosis, make sure that you are familiar with the type of uh, def the type of neuropathology, not neuropathology, but the, what you're testing for is it, it within the scope of your practice, within the scope of your expertise. Um, so you don't evaluate a patient if you don't have enough knowledge of, for instance, if you've never seen someone with Parkinson's disease, it's appropriate to seek consultation. Um, uh, you know, especially if there's, you know, there aren't alternatives for someone else to see them. So there are instances where you 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 go with what you have, but there the aspiration is that you are using tests in the appropriate way that have been normed on the patients that you're seeing or the population of patients that you that you're seeing. You mentioned uh, the APA uh, principles ethical guidelines. What is the yeah. what what is the acronym APA stand for? It's the American Psychological Association. It's a professional uh, guild organization that in, that includes, I mean, the full scope of clinical psychologists as well as a, a variety of other individuals, therapists and counselors, etc. Does it set, set standards for the uh, industry? It, yes. What about, uh, is there a, another body called the AACN? Well, the American Academy of uh, Clinical Neuropsychology is a professional organization um, that is um, uh, not everyone who is a clinical psychologist it belongs, uh, but there are a couple of different professional organizations that are similar. The National Academy of Neuropsychology or NAN is another. Um, these are professional organizations that, you know, hold annual uh, conferences where uh, continuing education courses take place. And the AACN uh, membership in the AACN, there is affiliated members who are uh, potentially board eligible, uh, but a full membership requires being board certified by the American um, uh, the uh, American Board of Professional Psychology, the ABEP. And, and does the AACN, do, do they have guidelines for uh, the um, correct performance of an assessment of a patient? They do. They do. And those include similar themes um, and, uh, and offer some explicit, so some things that differ from sort of generally speaking, psychological assessment that's performed by many clinical psychologists. Um, including uh, just the basics, like test test selection uh, being done appropriately, uh, but also the you know the making an accurate diagnosis or making a uh, uh, taking a complete history, doing what you can to make sure that you and you know uh, interview a collateral and so forth. It's a guide guideline for performing an assessment. And did. Dr. Uh, Schwartz's um, evaluation, uh, as uh, summarized in C7, uh, did, did that fall outside what you uh, thought were the guidelines uh, established by the APA and the AACN? It did. In my opinion, it did. And I felt that uh, another qualified 
neuropsychologists would find would also find the same. Do you know whether this was um, do you know whether this was ever referred to an outside uh, agency, uh, outside hospital? I don't know for certain, but I don't, I, I have no reason to believe that it was, but I wouldn't necessarily know. Uh, no one circled back with you from an outside hospital to say, I have some questions or some thoughts about this uh, peer review uh, that you had submitted. N no. You mentioned uh, Julie Jackson um, and uh, she was the uh, would you call her, her title was director? Manager or director, I think, depending upon the date. Okay. And did she leave that position uh, at any uh, time after you submitted the uh, peer review? Yes. Um, she got promoted to another level and a new uh, manager was assigned to our section uh, she was introduced i don't know in march or april to us as being the new director of the section a new manager of the section i cannot recall the terminology um, she was also a nurse by training um, and she uh, took over for julie jackson in may i believe may of 2017. and what is uh, her name uh, jessica zercher and spelling of Zercher? I'm going to let you do that. How about Z-U-E-R-C-H-E-R? -E All right. Sound about right? Yes. That's correct to the defendant or to the respondent. Good. All right. Thank you. Did Ms. Um, Zercher, uh, you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, Julie Jackson had performed um, uh, yearly evaluations. Uh, did that practice continue uh, under uh, Jessica Zercher? Yes. And I apologize, I, I should have um, just included that in uh, my uh, exhibits uh, C38 to C49. It is in there, um, Judge. Judge but it's actually at C51, and then we'll have to find it in there. If, uh, so which one do you want me to bring uh, up first? Uh, C51, please. Okay. Okay, so this looks like C51. Yes. And then and you then said it's... You could scroll down to um, Exhibit 6, uh, which is an attachment... Okay. Here. I should have taken it out and put it as a separate as document, a separate. but I neglected it. So exhibit six. I think it's coming up here. It should be. Yes. So here's exactly. exhibit six of, or yeah, exhibit six, exhibit six which is part of uh, C51. Right. Okay. Um, um, and, and before we, right, before I'm going to object to the extent that the attorney Plantica is introducing or plans to introduce Exhibit 51 into evidence into the record. It's irrelevant to these proceedings. It's the respondent's original position statement. I believe it's dated three years ago without the benefit of discovery. I'm okay with discussing the performance evaluation, which I don't object to its authenticity or admissibility, specifically the performance evaluation from 2017. But if we were to move this into the record, I object to moving up the whole of uh, the position statement, Exhibit 51, into the record. 
Do you have any uh, response? Well, I'm, I only plan on doing this one portion of it. So um, I, I don't legally, I don't agree because I think it's a statement of a party opponent or its representative. Uh, so I think it's not hearsay that way, but, and his other concerns go to wait, but I don't really feel we need to have a ruling on that because I'm just going to use this uh, performance evaluation as part of my direct uh, with, with this witness. Okay. Go ahead then. I'm sorry. Can I ask a question? So what, what is the document that uh, attorney Mitchell was? What is that? I know the number, but what is it exactly? It's, it's a position, position statement, statement that they submitted during the investigation. So was that the findings? No, no, it's what the respondents submitted oh. as part of the investigation. All and right. this is just part of an exhibit that they submitted. All right. All right. Could we go to um, page uh, four of six? All right. Is right there, there a certain part of the page you want me to focus in on? Um, if, if we could go to uh, just just a down the, the leader comments. Um, right there is good. Okay. Uh, there is a. Uh, uh, a heading called uh, teamwork um, service. Do you see that? Probably don't because it's just above the fold now. Teamwork service teamwork. compassion. Do you see that? Dr. McMurray? Yes. Okay. And when you have these evaluations, there are both leader comments and also employee comments, correct? Correct. And I understand that you know over over the years that uh, things changed, um, you know, in terms of how these were formatted. But uh, for purposes of this one, the leader comments uh, would have been made by whom? Uh, Jessica Zercher. The, the rating you got was um, for that teamwork service compassion was uh, outstanding. Yes. Yes. And can you tell me, uh, is it of the ratings that were available to the, um, the leader, Jessica Zercher, is that the top? I think it's I a the document. I was going to say, I am not 100% certain that it is. Okay. There's, uh, there used to be one that was like goes beyond or beyond the something. I, I don't know what the. Does it say anywhere? I, it says at the top of the. Uh... This is the first page of exhibit of the exhibit. Yeah, I, in past ones, I know it uh, did talk about. Right. Rating. Wait, rating for universe, rating for universal expectations. Is it mate well? There. Oh. Oh. Um, I don't see it. I don't either, but maybe another document will discuss that. I know it's above highly rate highly valued. So there's, I know one of them is valued, highly valued, and outstanding. I don't know if there is another one that's higher than that. Okay. And it might be easier for me, Judge M, that the document uh, that I um, identify that we're looking at now at, uh, I know we're looking at a portion of it, but can you get to see that uh, number again? So I can find it on mine. The number again, uh, you mean the exhibit number or it's exhibit 51? Okay. Uh, exhibit six of exhibit 51. And I do see that you had some performance reviews, but I guess we didn't have. That was the only one for 2017, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I put a post-it note on it so I could find it, and I just found it. Um, all right. This will make it a little bit easier uh, for me to get, get to the right uh, part. Um, so we've, uh, we've looked at uh, teamwork, service, compassion. Um, could we go to the uh, next page, which is page five of six? All right. And then there's uh, a category called uh, values, uh, respect, and fun. Do you see that? Dr. McMurray? Yes. Okay. And what rating did you get for that? Highly valued. Then if we go to the last page, which is page six of six, there's leader comment, leader overall comments. Do you see that? Yes. Yeah. All right. And uh, that says, Pam, uh, you are a highly valued employee with significant tenure in the department. I'm thankful that you are a member of our team. As we continue to grow the department and expand services, I will look to you for creative problem solving to support change in the department. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Yeah. Do you know, um, in terms of, uh, do, do you have a meeting with uh, Jessica Zercher um, concerning this uh, 2017 performance evaluation? Um, yes, well, we, so when she first came on board, we each individually had meetings with her. Um, and then when, when we did this evaluation, which was several months later, um, she was, she came to my office and we met, uh, but beforehand we're given the opportunity to write our own, uh, you know, our individual comments. So they're incorporated into the document prior to the leader coming with the document to have the have us each sign. And and there's two dates that are showing up on the screen, 818 of 2017 and 828 of 2017. Mm -hmm. Do you know uh, if that is uh, either of those are the dates when you met or would that have been when the written submissions were uh, completed or, or do you know? Uh, I do not know. I I assume so. I would have signed the document. Um, uh, obviously, on that, on, I, my guess would be that was the day of the evaluation. That's typically how it was done. Um, uh, so I'm guessing that the, the, the form. I don't know for certain. Okay, uh, I move into uh, evidence um, exhibit uh, six of that. Uh, just the, the, that portion of, of the exhibit uh, that uh, we identified. All right. Did you have any other objections, Attorney Mitchell, to just receiving my receiving exhibit six? Uh, well, I, I understand my objection that I think the entire exhibit, exhibit you want itself is uh, prejudicial to the respondent, but I would suggest that the respondent also has this same performance evaluation as a respondent exhibit, uh, respondent exhibit 10. Um, perhaps it would be cleaner to introduce that exhibit into the record if attorney Fentica has no issue with I, that. I have no I have no objection to that. It would just substituting one for another. So respondents 10. Yeah, it, Respondent Exhibit 10 is a group exhibit with several of Dr. McMurray's performance evaluations, uh, specifically her fiscal year 16, or excuse me, her fiscal year 17 um, performance evaluation is the first six pages of Respondent Exhibit 10. Okay. So I'll receive, well, are you, are you saying we should, I should receive just those first six pages of Exhibit R10 then? Yeah, then I find with the entire exhibit being moved into the record. They're just Dr. McMurray's performance evaluations. So unless Victor has a objection. 
No objection. All right, so then I'll receive R10, the entire document into the record. All right, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead right. and continue. It looks like you're looking for something. Did you need another document to be brought up? Um, if I could just, I'm taking a, um, uh, so my understanding is that R10 is all the performance uh, reviews. Yeah, I can bring it up on the screen if you want to take a look at it. Okay. Um, what I was wondering is if we could take a look at just, um, or we could use my exhibit for that. Uh, why don't? I've got R10 on the screen right now. Okay. So that should be all the performance evaluations. Could we go to um, uh, the August 2015 one? Okay. So going back in time. All right. Let me just scroll down to get to that one. It should begin on page 43 of the PDF. You said page 43? The fiscal year 15 performance evaluation, yes, begins on page 43. This respondent exhibit 10 is the performance evaluations for the fiscal years 11 through 17. Yeah. Okay, so this should be exhibit or page 43 fiscal year 15 review. Right. Uh, yeah. Dr. McMurray, uh, who did your 2015 uh, review? Um, Julie Jackson did. And was this before or after you had done your um, uh, peer review? So uh, I had, so to be clear, I did a request for a peer review. Um, and I did, I did that after this evaluation. Um, and we had had the discussion of this evaluation and I had signed the evaluation before I, um, well, I should take that back. I don't know if I had signed it. We had performed the review and I had sought verbal assurances from her about my, you know, being safe, bringing things up. And she, uh, that's when I brought the case to her attention. So I wrote the request subsequent to this evaluation. And when you say this request, you're saying the request for the peer review. Yes. Yeah. Right. Could we go down to page four of seven of uh, fiscal year 2015? Okay. Here's page four. Is there a certain part you want me to focus in on? Um, the I think you're there. Um, okay. There's uh, under the category accountabilities, competencies, values. Do you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. And then there are leader comments. And who made those leader comments? Uh, Julie Jackson did. Um, as uh, Pam has had to work through a lot of changes over the past year, past year, I'm sorry, for the past four to five months, there have not been any issues. Pam can be overly critical of other people's opinions, which I'm having trouble reading it because it's so small. Which can make it me, I can make it a little bit larger. Oh, okay. right. I don't know if that helps. 
which can make it difficult to discuss issues depending on the topic. However, I respect Pam's opinion on issues and and she very strong in critical thinking. In the past four to five months, Pam has been keeping comments and her demeanor as constructive as possible in the interactions I have witnessed. And, and that's what uh, Julie Jack, first of all, I, did I read that correctly? Yes. yes. Uh, and is that what uh, Jessica, sorry, um, Julie Jackson Julie. wrote on your 2015 uh, review? Yes, yes. yes. Earlier, we had uh, looked at the 2017 uh, performance review, um, and uh, that was done by uh, Jessica Zercher, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. And she had assumed Julie Jackson's uh, position uh, overseeing neuropsychology? Yes. When did your uh, employment with Pro Healthcare uh, end? November 2nd, 2017. And how did it end? I was met at the door at 7.30 in the morning by Julie Jackson and Jessica Zucker um, as I walked into the hospital from the parking structure. And I was told that we were going to HR and I suggested that I drop my briefcase off at my office and uh, uh, Julie Jackson said there's no need to do that. And we went up to the HR office, which is also located in the professional office building. And we went into the HR office, Julie Jackson and I did, Jessica was not involved. And there I uh, met with another person from HR, someone I didn't, I don't, recall ever having met with before um, and was told that I was being terminated. And I asked the reason and I was I was told that they were going a different direction uh, by Miss Jackson. Um, but I was not given any other reason and she pointedly said we don't have to give a reason. Um, and I was walked out of the building by security. Did you ever receive a reason by uh, Julie Jackson as to your termination? No. no. How long had you been with Pro Healthcare um, in early uh, November 2017? Uh, December of 2017 would have been my 15th year. So 14 years and 11 months, 10 months. Had you had any indication before that time, before November 2, 2017, that uh, your uh, firing uh, was imminent? None whatsoever. Not, I was literally shocked and speechless. In the time leading up to uh, November 2, 2017. Uh, did you, were you asked to have any meetings, uh, coding meetings uh, with uh, any uh, individuals who worked for Pro Healthcare? No. Were you asked about any difficult interactions with any other staff or employees of uh, Pro Healthcare? No. No. What was your uh, salary um, when you were, or what was your compensation, I should say, uh, when you were terminated? Uh, I, I believe based on the severance uh, paperwork, it was $127,000 a year. And I believe like a bi-monthly bi gross was in just over 4,000. Uh, I'm not talking about any uh, uh, severance amount, uh, but uh, do you know where you paid? No, that, that was based on my rate of pay at the time. Okay, uh, $127,000 a year. Yes. After November 2, 2017, 
Um, did you make attempts to become uh, re-employed uh, in the field of neuropsychology? Uh, actually, immediately, I had uh, I put in an application for a position at the VA that closed on the 10th of November, um, and uh, submitted that through the portal to apply for a position um, at the VA. What was the pay at the VA uh, versus what you were being paid at for healthcare? Well, I had interviewed for and been offered a position at the VA in 2015 and ultimately ended up declining the position because the pay grade was so substantially below what I was making at the time. Uh, I believe it was $112,000. Um, and uh, I so I, that wasn't the only reason, but I declined the position. So I, I assumed that the rate of pay would have been the same for a new position. In other words, uh, you applied for the VA even though you concluded based on your prior interactions with them that your um, pay would uh, decrease. Right, in comparison to my job that I had. So um, applying for the position now was a, in order to have a position. Object to speculation as to whatever the VA was offering in terms of salary. It, it is public. That's fine. You can go ahead and continue. Okay. In uh, in other words, uh, when you say that you were offered a position at the VA, that was back in 2015, but you were not offered that position in 2017. I didn't get a call back. Okay. Are there other places that would attempted to get a, a job as a neuropsychologist? Yes. yes. Uh, the, sometime in early uh, 2018, <clears throat> I contacted a professional colleague uh, by the name of Joe Cunningham, who is a neuropsychologist with Aurora. And in, <clears throat> I believe it was 2014, I had applied for a position. Um, at Aurora um, and been offered been extended an offer of a position um, oddly enough uh, as a in the neuro oncology unit um, and I declined uh, that position um, after uh, after evaluating both the I would be spending full time doing neuro oncology which is not an area of particular interest of mine. Um, and I did not want to commute. And I received verbal assurances from Julie Jackson that she didn't intend to fire me. I explained to her that I had been given the job offer and that I didn't want to take it. Uh, but if she felt that I was still problematic, that I would take the position. And she said, no, things are going well. So I turned down the position. And so when I called Joe, they were actually hiring. They had posted a position for four neuropsychologists. Um, but when I had an exchange with him on email, and uh, he indicated that they were focusing on early career individuals um, and that they had already hired two. Um, and so I, I did uh, send an email to the physician recruiter with whom I had worked previously. Um, and again, did not receive a reply. 